let's introduce ourselves to chemical thermodynamics. And we're going to try to relate the first, second, and third laws of thermodynamics. We've already discussed the zeroth law. Relate them to the chemical reactions and specifically be able to predict whether a reaction will be spontaneous or favored or not spontaneous or not favored by looking at the entropy change, enthalpy change, and temperature. Thermodynamics deals with the study of the energy changes that accompany physical and chemical changes in matter, whether they're chemical reactions or not. But it allows us to predict whether chemical reactions will occur under certain circumstances. It's organized around the four laws of thermodynamics. The zeroth we've already studied. Heat flows from high temperatures to low temperature systems. The first, conservation of energy, which you've known about since you were kids. The second, entropy increases. And the third, entropy is zero at zero Kelvin. And it's therefore really unattainable, although the physicists have gotten very close to zero Kelvin. Uh, they've gotten to the point where molecular mo motion appears to have stopped, but the, uh, the zero Kelvin is, is theoretically unattainable to, uh, to get in a practical sense. First law of thermodynamics tells us that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Now, energy can change forms. For instance, we know, and we've worked with problems in which we convert heat to work or work to heat, P delta V. The total energy of the universe, therefore, is constant. Now, this, of course, means that we have to understand that matter is a special form of energy, the energy of matter is time m times the speed of light squared. This is from the 1905 Special Law of Relativity. Enthalpy, we know, is the heat of a chemical reaction at constant pressure. In all chemical reactions, delta H, the change in enthalpy, is the sum of the enthalpy of formation of products minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation of reactants. And this is something that you should be able to do based on your work with thermochemistry from earlier in the year. Now, we ask the question, what makes a reaction spontaneous? And here I'll just throw a parenthesis in. Spontaneity is not what the AP examiners like to hear you talk about. What they like to hear you talk about is in a different language. But spontaneity does not refer to a fact or the idea that if you mix two chemicals, a reaction instantaneously occurs. And that's one of the reasons why the word spontaneity is frowned upon in much conversation in physical chemistry. What we want to know is if you get a reaction started, Will it go to completion by itself, or will you have to do work or input energy in order to make it happen? That would be a non-spontaneous reaction. So instead, we talk about changes being favored, and favored changes then occur all by themselves without a net energy input. Yes, you may have to put in some activation energy, but once you have gotten the reaction started, it goes to completion all by itself. That's a favored change. Non-favored changes will not occur by themselves. Processes that are favored in one direction, the forward reaction, like the burning of coal in oxygen to form carbon dioxide, they are non-favored in the opposite direction. Carbon dioxide will not decompose into carbon and oxygen gas. We have to force something like that to happen. Now, our modern AP terminology uses the term favored instead of spontaneous and non-favored instead of non-spontaneous. What makes a reaction favored? Well, intuitively, we know that there are two classes of chemical reactions that do go typically go to completion. 
The first would be exothermic reactions, highly exothermic reactions, because by definition they don't need net energy inputs to occur. The other is reactions that increase the net disorder of the system, because disorder is more probable than order. We'll look at this more in a little while. That's uh, explosions, decomposition, flames. Those are increasing the disorder of a system. Uh, many of them are also exothermic. Here's an example. Carbon, sulfur, and the nitrate ion, if heated, will start a favored reaction. It'll go to completion, making carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, that, of course, is not a balanced chemical equation. This is an oxidation reduction that is really the explosion of gunpowder. What is entropy? Entropy, symbolized with a capital S, is the measure of the randomness or disorder in a system. It's related to the number of ways the particle in a system can be arranged without changing the internal energy. The more ways they can be arranged, the greater the entropy. That's something to keep very seriously in mind. And as usual, delta S for a change is the final entropy, S final, minus the initial entropy. It's always the final or products minus the initial, the reactants. If delta S is less than zero, the disorder is decreasing left to right. If delta S is greater than zero, the disorder is increasing left to right. Now the second law of thermodynamics deals with entropy, and it tells us that the entropy of a system tends to stay constant or to increase. It does not decrease. Entropy does not spontaneously decrease. Entropy will spontaneously increase. And you might ask, well, if this is true, why will an irregular crystal that's immersed in a saturated solution of the salt form a regular crystal, get ordered? And the answer is there's a slight energy reduction when you compare the energy of the regularly ordered, smooth-faced crystal to the irregularly formed crystal. And so if you look at it, the disorder here is greater than it is here, but there can also be an energy improvement going from here to here. Now in a phase change, and this will be the last thing we talk about for this video, as solids warm and liquefy and turn to gas, the entropy increases. I hope this is obvious. So the S of a solid is less than the S of a liquid, and that in turn is also less than the entropy of a gas. So let's look at the rigid solid. Now it's not so rigid because remember there is some molecular or ionic vibration in any crystal. But when we now warm it and pass the melting point, the molecules can now move over each other easily. They're not rigidly bound in the crystal. And so there's more states of disorder there. We have a fluid system. And then when we, and of course this is not well drawn because gas molecules are a lot further apart, the, uh, the gas has a much higher entropy than the liquid state of the same material. So this is a fluid which is also compressible. And when you have a phase change of solution, there you have the solid and the red surrounded by a solvent. As the solution process increases, the entropy increases. And here is your diagram. You can see again there is more possible states in the arrangement here because the crystal has been broken up by the solvent than in the crystal itself. Our next thing is we're going to talk about chemical changes in entropy in the next video.